Well, uh, how are you all doing tonight? <laughs> yeah, I'm starting to get in the mood here, you know, down in Texas. How many have you ever been to West Texas? Ever been to West Texas? I was at West Texas out somewhere, West Texas, when I was a student at the seminary. And uh, the folks out there, they're on an entirely different schedule. Entirely different. As a matter of fact, some of the folks out there, bless them, I think it takes them about an hour and a half just to watch 60 minutes. <laughs> so, it's a different life out there. Different life. Yes, you are going to have to invite me back if you want to hear the messages that are printed in the brochure. Because tonight I'm speaking on the topic, healing the hurt. Healing the hurt. And I'm speaking on that topic simply because if you want to understand something of what takes place during revival, which is the theme of this conference, you will know that one of the things that God always does when he works in the human heart is bring about reconciliation. Satan divides. God unites. And all the walls and the barriers that have been put up because of sin have to come down when the Holy Spirit is really at work in the lives and hearts of people. So I'm speaking on the topic healing of the hurt. Some time ago a friend of mine told me a story that deeply grieved me but in principle it is one that has been told a thousand times. A pastor was going to get a divorce. He had to tell his wife and his children actually that they were going to be divorced and so one day he and his wife decided to share the shattering news with two boys aged seven and nine. Here he was a Christian minister, a graduate of an outstanding seminary but he and his wife were going to be divorced. And so they told the parents or the children that it was all over. How do you think the nine and the seven year old boy reacted? You've predicted right. They began to cry uncontrollably, these little boys did, and they began to shout almost hysterically, why can't you and mommy work it out? Can't you work it out? mommy and daddy aren't going to work it out because mommy and daddy are angry and they're not going to work it out. They're going to go their separate ways. A number of years ago my wife and I were coming back from Dallas, Texas to Chicago and we stopped at a restaurant in St. Louis and sat next to a woman and she was there with a little girl who was perhaps three and this little girl struck up a conversation with our little girls and so they were talking and suddenly a man came in sat down beside her and she and this man got into an argument and because we couldn't help but overhear the conversation we picked up on the story we knew what was happening these two people had been divorced and this man was now coming to pick up his little girl for the weekend but they were having an argument over money he said that he had sent child support. She was saying that she had not received it. And then the little three-year-old went out into the night with daddy to spend the weekend with him. Now you just think for a moment about that little girl. Think of what it is that she must put up with. She's supposed to love mommy during the week. She's supposed to love daddy on weekends. But mommy and daddy don't love each other. Mommy and daddy can't stand each other. They can't be together five minutes without having an argument even in the presence of other people. Imagine the emotional baggage that she is going to carry with her into her adult life and into her marriage because of the hurt that has been brought about because of that situation. Statistics indicate that approximately one half of all of the children born in America this year will at some time live because of a single parent or live with a single parent, I should say, because of divorce. Imagine the tremendous trauma and the wounded emotions with which this generation is growing up. So there is a lot of hurt in families. There is also a lot of hurt in churches. Churches sometimes have disputes and arguments. <coughs> and so there is a lot of hurt that sometimes exists in the lives of people that they have never really taken care of. And Jesus knew that that would happen and so he gave us a lesson on healing the hurt. It was really a lesson on forgiveness.
I want you to turn with me in your Bibles tonight to the 18th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 18. Jesus was speaking to the disciples about the need for reconciliation, for the need of forgiveness. And I would just like to say to you that if you have never forgiven or never had to forgive, I would simply have to assume that you have not lived. Because it is not possible to go along in life without someone at some time doing you wrong. That is part of the human situation. The world is so constituted that when I hang on to my rights, I deprive you of your rights. And so there has to be a balance of rights. And so there are situations in which a person does something to please themselves, which inevitably causes hurt to somebody else. That's just the way life is. And so Jesus knew that we would have to have a lesson on forgiveness. What I'd like to do today is to give you three characteristics of forgiveness. Three characteristics of forgiveness. The first characteristic of true forgiveness is this, that true forgiveness always aims at restoration. It aims at restoration. Mind you, it does not always achieve it, but it aims at restoration. Notice in chapter 18, verse 15, Jesus said this, And if your brother sins, go and reprove him in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every fact may be confirmed. Jesus is saying, if there is a dispute, you are to go to your brother, not to clear your conscience, not to prove who is right, but first and foremost, you are to go to bring about reconciliation, and the text says, go. It's very hard to do. Most of us would rather spend some time giving a prayer request in prayer meeting regarding the awful things that this person has done. Or we might want to nurture a grudge or tell someone else about it via the telephone or whatever. But it is very difficult for us to go to the person who has offended us or the person against whom we have a grievance and try to straighten it out. That is very difficult to do, but Jesus said you should go. And then Jesus said that if that doesn't work, then you should take two or three with you to bring about reconciliation. And if that doesn't work, you should tell the church. And the whole church should really render a verdict based on what the leaders have to say regarding this situation. And if there is no reconciliation, that person who is the offender should be excluded from the fellowship, Jesus Christ said. Why? Because God demands unity before he can really work in the life of a church. And so what Jesus is saying is that you should try to bring about reconciliation. Sometimes reconciliation isn't possible. Here in the text it talks about the excommunication process because reconciliation was attempted but it was not achieved. But the goal of true forgiveness always is reconciliation. And there are some of you who have been hurt by parents and there is no possibility of reconciliation. But even so, as we shall mention in a moment, you should forgive, but nonetheless reconciliation may lo no longer be a possibility. But the goal of reconciliation, the goal of forgiveness, I should say, is always reconciliation. God wants to bring his people together. Now how important is this to God? Notice what the text says. Verse 20, for where two or three have gathered together in my name, there am I in their midst. Usually we say that this is a prayer meeting text. We say, well, you know, we don't have a very uh, big prayer meeting in our church, but thank God that there are two people that show up, and that's all we need. Because the Bible says, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. Well, my friend, I want you to know tonight that it does apply to prayer meeting, that where two or three are gathered together in the name of the Lord, he is there. But that's not the context of this passage. This context says that where two or three are gathered together in my name to bring about reconciliation, there I am to help bring it about. Jesus is saying that where people are gathered together in a spirit of forgiveness to bring about unity, I am there to help, to see that it gets done. I don't think I have ever sensed the presence of God more than at times when I have met together to reconcile. 
I remember a missionary who had problems with his mission board and we held a hearing at Moody Church and we brought about reconciliation. What a wonderful thing. It took a meeting of about three or four hours, but it was all talked through. We agreed on a course of action to take the dispute and to mitigate that dispute, to arbitrate it, and the principals agreed to what we suggested and reconciliation was brought about and it ended it with a time of rejoicing and praise to God. Why? Because the text says that where two or three are gathered together in the name of the Lord to bring about reconciliation, he is there. Where do you ever see the power of God more than in a pastor's study when you see a couple that has not been able to get along and where there is all kinds of bickering and hurts and alienation and maybe unfaithfulness and there they forgive one another and they are reconciled with tears of joy. Jesus said that where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there to bring it about. The goal of forgiveness, my friend, is always restoration. God wants to unify. There's a second characteristic of true forgiveness, and that is true forgiveness always costs. It always costs. In order to illustrate this, Jesus told a parable. It says in verse 21, Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him until seven times? The Jews said that you should forgive your brother three times, and that's it. So Peter takes the three, he multiplies it by two, he adds one for good measure, and in his best English says, Lord, how often shall my brother sin and I forgive him? Up until seven times. He probably expected to be commended. He expected Jesus to say, Peter, please go to the head of the class. You get an A+. Plus. Sit near the front. Incidentally, those of you who are near the front, you will be rewarded for that in heaven. No question about it. Blessed are they that sit in the front. For great shall be their reward in heaven. We have four people tonight in the front. And so he says, until seven times, and Jesus said, I say not unto thee seven times, but seventy times seven. Peter didn't have his slide rule, and they didn't have TI in those days. There were no pocket calculators. He must have thought a long while, what is seventy times seven? We know now it is 490. But I'm sure that what Jesus really meant was unlimited forgiveness. And then to illustrate, Jesus tells a parable. It says in verse 24, For this reason the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a certain king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. And when he had begun to settle them, there was brought to him one who owed him ten thousand talents. But since he did not have the means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and children and all that he had and repayment to be made. The slave, therefore, falling down, prostrated himself before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. Notice the picture. It's an awesome scene. It's the end of the fiscal year. The books are being opened, and there is a man there who owes 10,000 talents. A talent was probably worth, in today's money, about $1,000. So if you multiply $1,000 times 10,000, it's $10 million. I figured that out on a pocket calculator because I'm not very good at arithmetic. I always say that when it comes to math, as long as I'm right 90% of the time, who cares about the other 5%? <laughs> so you figure out $1,000 10,000 times $10 million. And so he throws himself before the presence of the king and says, have mercy upon me and I will pay you everything. One commentator trying to figure out how long it would take this man to pay it back at the going wage calculated several thousand years. How foolish. Have mercy upon me and I will pay you everything. Absurd. But remember that in this parable the king represents God and we are the slave. 
And how many people there are today who stand before God and who say, God, just have patience with me and I will pay you everything. I will pay my own debt. How ridiculous. Could my tears forever flow? Could my zeal no respite know? All for sin could not atone. Thou must save, and thou alone. We cannot pay our debt. Every once in a while I come across someone who says, you know, I hope to stand before God on the basis of my own record. Well, I want you to know that I'm not going to stand before God on the basis of my record. I would be terrified to stand before God on the basis of my record. And so the king forgives him the debt. Now I have to ask you a question tonight. Was this forgiveness free or was it not? The answer to that question depends on the perspective from which you view my question. The forgiveness was free so far as the servant was concerned. He was freely forgiven. But so far as the king was concerned, believe me, it was not free. The king at the end of that fiscal year was out $10 million, but he decided simply to absorb the cost. He said, I will forgive freely, but oh, how costly it is to me. I'm the one that absorbs it. Is God's forgiveness free? Yes, from our standpoint, it is absolutely free, no strings attached. Freely we have been forgiven. That's what grace is all about. Is it cheap? Did it cost God? Believe me, did it cost God? We are not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world. It cost God plenty. It cost God his son. That's how expensive it was. Death and the curse were in our cup, O Christ, was full for thee, but thou hast drained the last dark drop. Tis empty now for me. It cost him a lot. But notice this, that when God forgave, he absorbed the hurt. He says, I take the hurt and I set you free. Why? Because I said true forgiveness always involves a payment. You bear the hurt and you set someone free. Here's a woman whose husband has committed adultery. And he's a Christian man and he wants to straighten it up and he confesses his sin. And she is absolutely devastated because it is such a threat to her very personhood as a woman. She has been humiliated. She has been cheapened. But she chooses to forgive. She says, okay, I absorb the hurt. I will take that hurt and accept it. And I will not retain bitterness. I will forgive you and I will set you free costly so far as she is concerned someone begins a rumor about you that isn't true and it spreads throughout the church and people are saying things about you that are totally made up because this person was vindictive and said some nasty things and then later on because a revival rally comes or because they heard their pastor speak on the topic of forgiveness they get convicted and they come to you and say you know I'm really sorry but I spread all these lies about you and you're a Christian, and so you say, okay, I forgive you, I release you. But you have to bear the hurt. Because if your reputation was eroded, there's probably no way that you can fully gain it back. But you say, I set you free. I absorb the hurt, but you're free. You see, the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, he said, there should never be in the church a dispute that is brought to a law court. He said, it's terrible. He says, can't you Christians judge your own matters? Aren't there people in the church who are qualified to arbitrate? It's a travesty. Here you are believers who are going to judge the world and you can't resolve a dispute and you go before pagan judges of all things and then Paul says this should you not rather suffer wrong somebody chisels you out of a will 
They hire some lawyer, some clever lawyer, and he works his way around the will and you are left out and you want to go to court with your brother in Christ to resolve the dispute. Paul would say, should you not rather suffer wrong? You absorb the hurt and you set that person free because true forgiveness always involves cost. It did for God, it did for this king, and it involves a cost for us as well. True forgiveness always costs. There's a third characteristic, and that is the true forgiveness results, results in a forgiving spirit. It results in a forgiving spirit. Now, Jesus doesn't end the parable here. It says in verse 28, but that slave, we're talking about the forgiven slave, went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. That's about twenty dollars. And he seized him and began to choke him, saying, pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell down and began to entreat him, saying, have patience with me and I will repay you. Oh, but he was unwilling, however, but went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what was owed. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their Lord all that happened. Then summoning him, his Lord said to him, Get the picture. Here's the man who has just been forgiven ten million dollars. He's so excited he can hardly wait to get home and tell his wife. As a matter of fact, he thinks so much of the king that when he leaves the area where the king was seated, this man runs along the street and he has little tracts that he's giving out entitled four things the king wants you to know. He's sharing the good news of the gospel with whoever comes his way. He's saying, you can't believe this, but I owed ten million dollars and the king forgave me. And while he's out on the street corner witnessing about the goodness of the king, he happens to meet in to, with someone who owes him twenty dollars. And he said, hey, wait a minute, pay up what you owe. The man says, oh, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. The very words that the forgiven servant used moments ago. You would think that something within this scene would remind him of the fact that he had just been forgiven and he would freely say, oh my word, I've been forgiven ten million dollars, I can surely forgive twenty. But he doesn't. His heart is hardened. He says, I'm going to take you and throw you into jail until you pay what is owed. The question that we have to ask the text is this, does God actually revoke forgiveness once it is granted? If this were the only passage in the New Testament on the topic, we might suspect that, but Paul does say in the book of Romans that the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. I don't think that God ever takes back forgiveness. But what Jesus seems to be saying in the strongest possible language is this, that if you do not forgive someone, it is an indication that perhaps you yourself have not been forgiven. Amen. What he is saying is, is that forgiven people forgive. And it may well turn out that if you do not forgive, you are handed over to the torturers, which may be Satan even in the life of a Christian tortured until you become the one to pay the debt. You bear in your own body and your own spirit the consequences of an unforgiving heart. What I'd like to do is to summarize what we have said so far in three lessons. Three simple lessons. I've always prayed that the Lord would keep me simple. Some of my friends think he's overdone it just a little bit. What are those three lessons? First, we are to forgive just as we have been forgiven. We are to forgive as we have been forgiven. Because God has forgiven us so generously, because God in his mercy has been so good to us, having been forgiven the ten million dollars, we should be able to forgive the twenty dollars or the hundred dollars. Be tender-hearted, said Paul, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Now listen to me carefully. 
That means that you must forgive even if reconciliation is no longer possible. Some of you perhaps grew up with a father or a mother who could care less about reconciliation. You may not even know where they are, but you had better forgive because if you do not, you will pay the utmost farthing. You see, forgiveness is not only something that you do for somebody else, it is also something that you do for yourself so that you might not be the one that has to pay the debt. I think of a man in the Midwestern part of the United States took a train all the way to Pennsylvania to stand at the grave of a mother who had been a prostitute. This man grew up with intense hatred towards his mother because of all of the shame, all of the guilt, all of the hurt that she had heaped upon him as he was growing up. And there he stood at her grave for nearly an afternoon doing nothing but pouring out all the hurt and all the bitterness and all the ugliness and choosing in the name of Christ to forgive her. Now you see it was too late to be reconciled to her. It would have been better if he had done it when she was alive. But it is better to do it even if the person who has wronged you is dead. It is better that you do it that you not rather than not do it at all because if not you pay that utmost farthing forgiveness releases you you know the Bible says in the Old Testament that for this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife do you know that there are people who are married today who are still dominated by their father and their mother. There are sons that are totally dominated by their mothers. Mothers who may already be dead. But because the son did not get the approval of his mother or the approval of his father, he still has insecurities and bitternesses in his life that he has never released. And he is still dominated and under the authority of someone who may be 10,000 miles away or not living anymore at all. And it's because this boy or this woman has never chosen to forgive, they are paying in their own person the utmost farthing. We are to forgive as we've been forgiven. Secondly, and it's very obvious already, I stated it, if you do not forgive, you are the one who pays. You are the one who pays. You know, sometimes I've said to those who struggle with forgiveness so much, here's somebody who had a father who perhaps didn't pay attention to them or perhaps was unfaithful, an alcoholic father, all kinds of situations. I say to that person, do you really want your father who did you all these wrongs, do you really want your father to dominate you for the rest of your life and to control your life and make you unhappy until the day you die? And of course the first thing they say is absolutely not. <laughs> Well, if you don't want him to do that, you had better forgive him. Because if you hang on to those bitternesses, he will continue to ruin your life until the day you die. No one is as bitter and hurt and goes through as much agony as a person who has never released his feelings of bitterness to God and chosen in the name of Christ to forgive. Don't pay the utmost farthing. Finally, third, forgiveness is always an act of faith. Forgiveness is always an act of faith. I don't think I saw this clearly in the scriptures until just a couple of months ago. You know, I would preach on this topic of forgiveness and there was always something that really bothered me. And I'll tell you what it was. People would come up to me and say, Pastor, Okay, I hear what you're saying. But then they would shout something like this in their enthusiasm. Okay, we hear that you're saying that we're supposed to forgive, but where is justice? You know, you expect me to forgive this person who did all of these wrongs. 
Here he is. He leaves his wife and kids and he goes to Florida and he's got a good job and he's remarried. And look at how happy he is. And God is blessing his business of all things. And now you think that I'm supposed to just choose to forgive him. Who's going to settle the score? Who's going to bring justice to the situation? And I'm not sure I had a good answer to that. But I do tonight. Aren't you glad you came tonight? Four of you are saying yes, that's worth it. I saw this and it has released a lot of people because I want to tell you tonight you can choose to forgive anyone who has wronged you without surrendering one scintillica do you have that word down here no one iota better you can choose to forgive tonight without surrendering one iota of justice isn't that great turn to first Peter chapter 2 first Peter chapter 2 we'll see that Jesus did it and he's the pattern and because he did it, we can do it too, without surrendering justice. It's on page 1,152, uh, if you have a Bible like mine, uh, published by the name you can trust. Pray about that if you need to. First Peter chapter 2, verse 21. For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example to follow, for you are to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. What Peter is saying is that Jesus felt no obligation to even the score when he was here on earth. He didn't say, I'm going to vaporize you folks because of what you're doing to me. When he was harassed, he did not harass in return. When he suffered, he made no threats whatever. Is that because he was not interested in justice? No, the text says that he kept entrusting himself onto him who judges righteously. And Jesus was saying, I can suffer this indignity and this in injustice because I am convinced that someday the judge of all the earth will even the score for me. God is going to bring justice to every situation. And that's why I say forgiveness is such an act of faith. Because forgiveness says it is not up to me to even the score in this life. I don't know how it is down here in the south. Has sin come this far south? I don't know. I don't want to make any judgments. I know we have sin in Chicago. But I don't know about Dallas. My friend, there are so many hurts in this world that are never going to be straightened out by you and me. Never. We can try, and wherever we can, we should, but the hurts are beyond belief. And the things that people have done against you may never be straightened out. That father's love whom you, the love that you are still seeking from him, you may never receive it. Just live with that. For some people who are so shriveled emotionally, they can't love their children. So many injustices, it's unbelievable. But here's the point. When you forgive, you forgive in faith and you say, Father, I commit myself to you as Jesus Christ did. And I believe that someday, someday, you are going to even the score. So that man who walked out of the marriage and did this and that and so is so happily engaged in his business now and appears so happy, that man will someday give an account to God and God will judge him righteously. And what you do is you commit yourself fully to God 
and you say, God, this is out of my hands, but I'm going to trust you to bring justice. I believe that both with regard to the wicked who will be in hell and the righteous who will be in heaven, that when everything is finally wrapped up in history and eternity begins, we will see that the judge of all the earth did such a perfect job of meeting out proper punishment and justice and all of the things that he must untangle in the day of judgment that we will say to ourselves that justice has been fully served right to the last iota. There is a perfect balance of justice and righteousness in the entire universe. And God will do that. And tonight I'm asking you to trust him to do that and thereby to choose to forgive the person who has wronged you and commit them to God and say, God, they are in your hands and I'm going to trust you to do right by them. And if you don't do that, my friend, you are the one that will pay to the last penny. I don't know what hurts you brought here tonight. I have no idea. But there may be some of you who've got all kinds of hurts that you have to release tonight in the name of Christ. Will you remember this? Forgiveness is not an emotion. People say, oh, but I don't feel like it. Well, does that verse say, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God? Unless, of course, he doesn't feel like it. Then he has an exception. You don't have to feel like it. Forgiveness is a choice made in the power of the Spirit through the Word of God, and you choose in the name of Christ to forgive and to release and to set free. Would you do that tonight? Let's pray. Let's just be silent before the Lord for a moment. If you want God to bring revival to your life and to your churches, I know there are different churches represented here tonight. One of the first things that God does is he puts his hand on bitternesses and resentments and says, forgive. Why don't you just do business with God tonight? Now, Father, I pray in the name of Christ that you shall release your people. I pray, dear Father, that those who have lived with anger and bitterness and hostility may in this moment find your grace sufficient to free them. We ask in the name of Christ that you will enable them to open their hearts before you and say, Lord, I give you these feelings that I have hugged to my bosom all these years. I've kept them inside. I have nurtured them. I have thought about them. And now, Lord Jesus, tonight, because you are a righteous judge, I release these feelings and choose to forgive that I might be free. Free your people tonight, Father. For that young woman who may be in bondage because of a father whose love she never received, for that young man struggling with hurt because of his mother or grandmother, because of what happened to him in his family, among his brothers and sisters, or who knows what. Release them, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Tonight, what we're going to ask you to do is, if you want to have a time for prayer, would you go to the prayer room? That's, I think the family room tonight will go in that direction. Some of you may have to get on your knees and you may have to stay there a while. We only took out a moment to pray here. That is not long enough for some of you. Some of you have deep hurts. Why don't you go to that prayer room and say, God, I want to stay here as long as I have to stay here until I'm free. Would you do that? The Bible says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. And tonight, you maybe just need that time be in God's room, God's place.
meeting the Lord. With that, we are dismissed. Unless you have something to say, Neil. Okay.